Thank you, Odie. Thank you again, Alicia. I appreciate you being with us so much this morning. Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you. Our hearts are troubled this morning. I'm not sure where you are with your emotions right now. Uh, if you've been paying attention to our community and the news, uh, you're well aware of the tragedies that have occurred and the things that are so greatly plaguing us. Um, we're going to do things a little differently this morning. I want to have some thoughts for you, and uh, I'll beg Linda's pardon. She worked hard to get my notes on the bulletin as we were going to look into Revelation this morning, and I do want to make a couple comments about that, but we'll just put that back on the bulletin for next week, okay? Uh, I just felt like uh, after Debbie and I were talking yesterday that uh, the things that have occurred here in our city are just a little bit too pressing on us personally to go past it without taking some time to look into the Word of God this morning and to see what the Lord would have for us. And so I pray that you'll indulge me this morning. I uh, kind of threw out my notes, so to speak, and early this morning put some things together. And um, not sure how it's going to come out, but we'll just trust the Lord for that, okay? And so... Um, I do want us to, after I have some thoughts from the Word this morning, I want us to go into a time of prayer as a church. And so during that time, uh, I'd like to ask our deacons and our elders, those who are here, to come forward and uh, have you pray uh, for us as a body of believers. And then we'll observe our time with the Lord in communion, okay? So um, we're here on His time. And I don't know about you this morning, but I'm thankful to be God's child. I'm thankful to be a part of his kingdom and his church. As I was putting some of these thoughts together this morning, I couldn't help but think of what people are thinking right now. If you've been reading posts online uh, through Facebook and various things, uh, no doubt you've heard all kinds of comments, a lot of finger pointing, uh, a lot of blame shifting. And uh, it leaves us as believers often wondering how we're to respond. To things like this. Uh, tragedies, you know, uh, like you're thinking, I'm sure, many of you have been in other parts of the world, you see the events that occur, and you still have the tendency to be able to say as tragic as they are, they're still over there. They're still in other parts of the world, but when they come to the very places that we make our habitation, uh, they become very real in a different way, don't they? In fact, we were just talking to our daughter, Anna, last night, and she was hearing about all that was going on, and wanting to make sure we were okay, and she says, it's just so hard for me to believe uh, this, where all this happened yesterday was the place that I go with my friends and, and meet for coffee, and uh, it's just a, a normal part of my day when I'm in Charlottesville, and uh, to have something like this is really, really tragic. And so I wanted to address some of what your thoughts might be this morning and um, hopefully give you some insight into what the Lord says about how we are to live our lives and how we're to respond. Now, many of you who are very mature believers will say, yeah, well, I've heard this before. Praise the Lord. We're going to keep hearing it until we learn how to live it and our world begins to hear it. Uh, we are living in desperate days. You hear that almost in a cliche kind of a way. I've said it many times, but I think our study in Revelation has made it very clear to us that uh, life is going according to the plan that the Lord has laid out. And so, on the one hand, we're not surprised by the things that we see spiritually, the things that are part of our own culture, our own community now, uh, that has come in and the world sees us now and is uh, forever will have Charlottesville on the map in some way, according to the, the tragedies that have occurred uh, here. Uh, but that's not what we as a church want to be remembered for. We are to be God's people. We are to be His voice. We are to be his hands and his feet, and we are to be his heart. And it's up to us, with the power of the Holy Spirit, as Odie was praying, to help us to be just that. This is a wonderful time for us to be the voice of God, for us to have an answer for people, because people will be asking the question. They may ask the question in a pointed finger way. They may ask it in a blaming way, but they're asking the question. I'll never forget the guy who was the uh, very devout atheist that came to see me one evening 
and uh, wanted to know a lot of answers to the questions of the scripture. And I finally got to the place where I said, well, what are you really looking for? Because he really wasn't accepting the things that I was saying. He says, I'm looking for the truth, just like that, almost in a frustrated kind of a way. I want to know what the truth is. And that's what the world is looking for. Even our community this morning is looking for the truth. And we have it. We have the answer. And it becomes a part of us uh, desperately to share what the truth is. Many of you all will remember uh, the riots back in uh, the 60s and the 70s, the race riots. Some of you all remember that well. I was still a pretty uh, young guy at the time, but I can remember vividly my cousin telling stories of coming back from his day in the high school and being uh, threatened with knives and guns and all kinds of things. I can remember that very well. Uh, probably the most clear in our minds is back in 1992, the L.A. riots. Uh, you remember that well, the video footage that we saw and just the terrible things that were occurring in the city there. There were lots of finger pointing going on there. Uh, one of the main questions that came up was, who started all of this? Remember that? The news reports were going out and saying, well, who, who was it that really began all of this. Well, it was the cops. They were the ones that beat Rodney King. No, it was Rodney King, and it was the black community. No, it was the white community, and, and everybody was blaming each other, and that's exactly what we're seeing again today. It's the Republicans. It's Donald Trump, and others are saying, no, it was Obama. You know, it's Hillary. It's, it's the Democrats. It's whomever, and there are a lot of people wondering. I remember when John MacArthur preached a message in particular on the L.A. riots, he answered the question, which I thought was very, very astute. And he said, what caused the L.A. riots? Sin caused the L.A. riots. That's what caused the riots. And beloved, we could answer the same question this morning. What caused what happened yesterday, and I haven't heard anything about today, forgive me if there is more that's happened, but uh, whatever happened Friday night, whatever happened yesterday, came as a result of one thing, sin. That's the problem. Sin is the problem. And sin has always been the problem. Every window that is smashed, every item that is broken, every fight that's caused, everything that happens, every person that's run over by a car, by some crazy person is a result of sin. And I bring that up because I think it's important for us as God's people to remember the drastic and the tragic effects sin has had on us on a community. It is sin that has brought the problems through the heart of mankind from the beginning of time when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And it is being fulfilled right in, our very, in front of our very eyes. I haven't heard who these people were that were uh, hurt um, from either side, I guess, but specifically the ones that in the car problem, the car uh, wreck uh, attack, I guess you would say. But no doubt, some of you may hear those names and you'll know who they are in a community the size of ours. And uh, it will become very real and very personal for you. So again, what caused the problem? Sin caused the problem. It has to be registered in our mind very, very carefully and very consciously. Now, I'm not saying that people shouldn't stand up for what they believe is right. We live in a culture, we have been given a society by God with the brain that tells us what is right and what's wrong. And so people have the right, they should stand up and say what's right and wrong. But there needs to be a right that is propelled and promoted that is truly right. And that is the right that comes from the response of love. We just sang about it. We have said that we believe this. And I want to share with you just a few thoughts from Scripture this morning about how love is in the heart and the mind of God and how love should be the response at any time there is anything going on in the world. Again, I'm not arguing against the fact that there shouldn't be times where we stand up and we say, no, this is what needs to happen because of this, this, and this. I'm not arguing against any of that, so don't hear that. I'm not just saying we just love, love, love like the flower children of the 60s and the 70s. What I am saying is that love is truthful. Love gives its place in truth, which comes directly from God. 
In Matthew chapter 5, and we don't have this on the screen for you this morning, again, because I changed all of this this morning. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48. Jesus said this, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, where was he getting that? Well, he was getting that from the philosophy of the day from the Pharisees that were beginning to promote that there are only certain people that you love and others you don't. But notice what Jesus says in response to that. I mean, really, he's very much countering the whole philosophy of the human mind there. We're seeing this very same thing in our culture today right here in Charlottesville. No, I'm going to love these people, but I'm going to hate these people. And that's right according to the sinful mind. But the godly mind, Jesus says in verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies. What? And pray for those who persecute you, but notice this, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles or even the unsaved people, that's a, a word for the unsaved world, the non-church folks, do the same. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. There is an incredible dichotomy between the sinful minds thinking about what love is and what the Lord says love is. We are not to shout down one another. We are not to raise our fists against one another except by the authority structure according to Romans 13. We are not to stand higher on a platform based on our own opinion. We are to stand on the word of God and express what God has said. And what God says is that we are to love in righteousness. Now again, that doesn't mean that we don't disagree with people. And it doesn't mean that we don't passionately disagree with people. But we do it out of a heart that's motivated by love for them, but especially first for God. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, Jesus also answered, this is in verse 29 and through 31, Mark 12. Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. To which some of the folks in the scripture said, well, Jesus, I have a question. Um, who exactly is my neighbor? Well, your neighbor is still going to be here in Charlottesville who is very much opposed to you being a Republican, if that's what you are, or if you're an independent, or if you claim some other affiliation, or if you're a Trump supporter, or whomever, or if you're a Hillary supporter. These are your neighbors. And they're looking to find an answer to the question as to how all this stuff happens. Well, Jesus says our response is you are to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Romans 13.10, this is the passage of where Paul begins by speaking about the authority structure, that we're to obey all authority, that all authority is by God. But in verse 10, he makes a very profound statement that really encompasses much of everything that we could even possibly Put under the subject of how we are to treat one another. Notice what he says in verse 10 of Romans 13. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Does that need a lot of explanation? It really doesn't, does it? Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. But I don't like how they... I don't believe in what their stance is, therefore I'm going to... No, God says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Notice, I did not say, and God does not say, we're not to correct, but we do it in love. 
we do it as the other person will listen and give hearty thought to it. We are to stand on the truth of what God's word says. We are not to give in to sin. We are not to just let people do whatever they want to do. We are to speak the truth in love. Love is the foundation. Everything we do is to be centered on the word of God. That's what I'm really saying here. Everything that we do is to be centered on the Word of God. Everything we hold to should be backed and supported by the Word of God. So when you have an opinion about something, and you're strongly opinionated about that, you need to make sure you can support that with Scripture. Do you hear that? You can have your opinions all day long. But you cannot force your opinion on someone else unless you are supported by the Word of God. Because the Word of God is the truth. Otherwise, it just becomes an opinion. Listen, Scripture teaches us that love is not an opinion. God has made this very clear. Love, in fact, is God. Look with me for a few moments at 1 John chapter 4. John, same writer of the Gospel of John, same writer of the Revelation, also wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, wrote this marvelous epistle through the power of the Holy Spirit about love. So in chapter 4, verse 7, John says, Beloved, and we know that he's talking to the church there, let us love one another, for love is from whom? From God. And listen carefully to what he's saying here. Love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, here's the problem. The world has its own idea of what love is. The problem with the world's idea is, if you listen closely, is that it is slanted towards what it wants in its sinful inclinations. And that becomes the definition of love that they operate out of. It is very emotion-based. It is slanted toward the sinful logic. Although it can be real-looking love and real-looking emotion, it can be very realistic. But what God is telling us here is that true love is not something that comes out of a slanted mind from a sinful heart, but true love can only come from one place, and that is from God himself. Very clearly right here, he says in verse 8, the one who does not love or have this love from God that only God can give, first of all, doesn't even know God, therefore they can't love because only God is truly love. So again, the world has a form of love, but not the kind of love that comes from God, the true love, the real love. I was going to ask you, honey, I don't know if you can do this or not, but can you pull up that thing? Do you have your phone where you can pull up that post that you showed me this morning? While she's doing that, I want to read you something. I won't be able to read all of it, but um, it's got some words in there that I can't repeat here. But I want to read this to you because it will give you an indication of where the world is coming from concerning things like yesterday. Some of you may have already seen it. This was posted by somebody that we know. I think it was a repeat post. It wasn't their, their own post. But you in your mind might be asking some of the questions of what is it that the world is so angry about? What is it that was causing this? Other than, of course, we already know from sin. But let me just read you some of the things that become really, in our minds, our being the church, our redeemed mind, we understand are Ill illogical. But it's not illogical to the unsaved mind. The right is looking, and that's us, at the results of their hate-mongering today in Charlottesville while gasping in disbelief. We didn't cause this. This isn't what we wanted, they all exclaimed. Well, when you fought to control women through reproductive abuse, you caused this. When you fought to instill your brand of religious terrorism as law, you caused this. When you denied well-researched and scientifically proven facts, you caused this. When you stayed silent in the face of continued illegal uh, redlining, you caused this. When you denied the facts showing a wage gap exists, you caused this. 
When you allowed a hoodie to be a sign of guilt and reason to enact deadly force, you caused this. When you elected officials who enacted egregious legislation that laid the bulk of the country's taxes on the poor and middle class while succeeding numerous tax breaks to the wealthy, you caused this. When you said all lives matter, you caused this. When you denied or repealed laws for safe, sane gun safety, you caused this. When you fought to keep people in love from marrying each other, you caused this. When you looked the other way as the NFL signed wife beaters and dog fighters yet left a peaceful protester in the cold, you caused this. When you myopically focused only on emails that were proven time and again to be non-issue, you caused this. When you chanted lock her up, you caused this. When you laughed as a man called for interference in our election process, you caused this. And it goes on. I won't take time to read all of them, but it goes on. And it just gives you a little bit of a flavor of what is being thought about even this morning as to what the problems are. We as believers need to have a godly response to this kind of thing. That's why we're here. We're here to be the voice of God from his word. And that's what I'm trying to help you with this morning is what is our response? How do we respond to things like this? Well, you may be much like I am saying, I don't know how to respond to every little detail of those things because I don't know the answers to those details. But here's what I do know. God loves you. And God loves me. And God came to rescue us from the sinfulness that we are all involved in. In other words, whatever the conversation ends up being, it needs to be focused on the fact that God loves, not that God is a promoter of hate. The world's going to hear that anyway because that's what Satan is breathing in their ears. Because the Bible says that the darkness loves the darkness, right? Because their deeds are evil. They love sin, and so they want to be a part of all of that instead of listening to what the real truth is. In fact, the scriptures will say, and I'm going to show you this next week very specifically, the scriptures will say that only the Lord can open the mind to hear the truth. And so we need to be praying that God will open the mind of people to hear the truth that we don't hate. We are just passing on the truth of what God has already said. God is the one who's brought this all to our minds and our understanding. We didn't conjure this up. But rather, I should say there are some who do conjure it up because they don't look into the Word of God to make the answers clear. And so a lot of different things are preached. Notice what John says in 1 John 4, 9. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In other words, God showed us what real love is. That is when He sent Jesus into the world. He didn't have to do that. He did it for one reason, because he wanted to rescue us, because he knew it was the only way we could be freed from the sinfulness of our own hearts and from the debt that we owe him. God says about those who don't understand this, is that in Psalm 14, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Tragic. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. The world needs to know that. Interestingly, the Lord almost verbatim repeats that same psalm in verse, Psalm 53. God sent Jesus, his only son, so that the world would hear the truth. And that's the message that we need to be proclaiming. In verse 10 of 1 John 4, in this is love, notice this, he's defining love even further for us, not that we loved God. Do you hear that? John's very clearly saying, the Spirit through John is saying, listen, you did not love God. He loved you. That's what he says. 
He loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation is just simply the appeasement for our sins. There was a debt that needed to be paid for our sin and God fixed it. He paid the price for us. But we don't have some corner on the market. We don't have some little stance that's better than somebody else that we can raise our fist against them. What we have is a heart that should be open because out of God's own grace and mercy, he provided something for us that we could not provide for ourselves, which was love. He came to rescue us when we couldn't rescue ourselves. And this is what the world needs to hear. Verse 11 in 1 John 4, Beloved, if God so loved us, then we also ought to love one another. How do we respond to the world? What do we say to the world? Well, we have to answer the question, first of all, what is it that really caused the tragedy? You know what caused the tragedy. Sin caused the tragedy. And by the way, the same kind of sin that you and I are both capable of. You realize that? The driver, the 20-year-old driver who drove into the crowd was no more capable of doing that than you and I are. Or I should say that the other way around. We are just as capable of doing that as he is. The difference is that God has given to us his own mind through his own gracious act of forgiveness. And now we have the ability to think like God thinks. And so we say, it's ridiculous. We can't do that. Now the world will say, oh, I can make a bad decision myself. I'm not going to do something like that. And many of, most of the world will not do that. But we also understand from the word of God that there are degrees of sin that propels itself into worse and worse classes and categories as it seeks out the darkness even further. And we know that from Romans 1 that the human heart will do one thing, and that is if it leaves God out of its life, it will follow its own wicked path into deeper and deeper and deeper darkness until this is what it's capable of doing. And you understand that this is why the world looks at the other people in the world and says, well, I'm not so bad as that person. That person's going to hell. I'm not because I'm a lot better than that person. And the reality is, according to God, no, that's not true at all. You're all capable of the same thing. And by the way, you're all going to the same place. What's the answer to the problem? Well, there are several answers. One is obedience to authority. Brother Arnold and I were just talking about this a few moments ago. We are to pray for those in authority over us. We don't have to agree with the authorities. No matter who it is, we pray for them. We beseech God. We beg God to give them a mind that is a mind after his own heart. And then we surrender ourselves to the gospel by sharing the gospel. Do you realize the answer is in the gospel? The answer the world is looking for is in the gospel. And we can't make them believe the gospel, but God can. But surely they're not going to listen to the gospel if they don't ever hear it. Right? Listen to this. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever is the whoever. Everybody in the world. Even those people that were shouting with the torches the other night. They fit into this category. Whoever believes, God will rescue them. But we have to believe that too. It is not for us to get angry. It is for us to pray. It is for us to share the love of God. Verse 15 of 1 John 4, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. The gospel, see, by confession of who Christ is, not just in the head but in the heart, gives credibility and evidence of the fact that the Spirit lives in us. In Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the penalty of the sin that we are under, under God. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. The world needs to hear this. 
Going on in verse 11, Romans 10, and we're almost done here. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Don't you love that? For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But listen carefully to verses 14 and 15 of that same chapter. Here's the thought that I was just giving you. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And Paul says, well, how will they believe in him if they've not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they're sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of good things. Do you know who that's written to? That's written to God's people. Beloved, listen. What we saw yesterday right here in our own community on the streets that you have walked many times, no doubt, the tragedy that occurred right here, God is saying to us loud and clear right here at Laurel Hill in all the other Bible-believing Bible churches is that the answer to the problems that Charlottesville will continue to face in the days ahead are found right here in the Word of God. And you, he says, are my vehicles to deliver the message. You are the hope for Charlottesville. Not your activist, not your fist-shaking, not your uh, mean-spirited, condescending responses to emotional outbursts, but through a heart of love that simply shares the truth of the gospel. Because you remember that if it weren't for the grace of God, I would be right there with them saying the same thing, doing the same thing, acting the same way, potentially doing the same kind of act. We have been rescued. Now I have to say, and this will bring us to a conclusion on this, um, I thought something that was very interesting and very appropriate for our study in Revelation is, and I couldn't, Debbie couldn't find it, but uh, did you notice, some of you noticed that there were people that were having signs that were saying something about getting rid of the Jews? Did you see those signs? Did you find that a little bit fascinating? <clears throat> I want to submit to you a thought. Based on everything that we know of Scripture, who has been Satan's arch enemies? It's the Jews. I want to submit to you that one of the things Satan has done this weekend is he has very cleverly disguised his attack against God's people. What the world sees as black and white, Satan sees as a process toward getting the Jews out of the world. Now, why would he be doing that, class? Jealousy, and we know because in Revelation, already now, that what's going to happen? What has already happened? God has promised that he will preserve his people they will one day come to the temple in Jerusalem and they will worship the true God. They will turn to the true God. Their eyes will be open and the Antichrist will become very jealous and he will break his pact with them in the middle of the three and a half years and he will attack them vehemently. Well, that same attack has been occurring in little skirmishes across the centuries and I think what we're seeing is that same fulfillment happening right here in our own city. What do the Jews have to do with this? You look at this with a kind of a common thought and you say, what in the world did the Jews have to do with this yesterday? What is this all about? Why, why that? Well, I'm sure there are some humanistic answers for that that people have that are not sensical. But the real truth is, beloved, it is a spiritual battle. That's what we're seeing. You're literally seeing the unfolding in your own town, the ridding, if you will, by Satan of the Hebrew people. It's a very appropriate timing as we are in the process of the Holy Spirit showing us this truth as we're going through Revelation. And so you can stand well informed that you're living in the times and the days when these activities are moving more and more in the direction. It is only going to get worse. I'm not a doomsdayer. I am one who's looking for the return of Christ, and that's a very exciting thing. I just happen to know that we're going to have to go through some stuff in order to, for Christ to first come back, right? 
I just hope that some of these thoughts will give you some ideas of answers and responses and how your own heart needs to be formed and formulated so that you can give some logical, well thought out, reasoned, loving responses to your coworkers. Because don't you think it's going to be a little interesting tomorrow when you go to work? I mean, do you realize that there is coming a day where all of this is going to begin to shift and not only is it going to be pointing the finger at the Jews, but who else is going to be the finger pointing? The Christians. It won't be long before the problem will be the church. It will be you. You will become the problem in Charlottesville. We're not seeing that specifically yet, but it's getting closer. In our lifetime, I don't know. I'm not going to set that. But I can confidently say it is coming. And it's very timely that we're studying through this. It's all going to culminate that way. I think it's very timely for you to be able to say to the people who don't want to hear about the things of God something like this. Well, let me just tell you what's going to happen. Well, how do you know what's going to happen? Well, I already have read the history that's coming it's going to get worse. And you, from your knowledge of the Scripture and Revelation just to this point, you can begin to share with them the breaking of the seals and all the judgments that are going to come and then the trumpet judgments and then eventually the bowl judgments and eventually there's going to be just an absolute holocaust unleashed, unleashed on this world and then our Lord is going to come back. That's what's going to happen. Oh, that's a bunch of mumbo-jumbo. Okay. We'll wait and see. You want to bet on that? Well, anyway, thank you for indulging me on that. I guess I was sharing a lot of my own heart, trying to find answers myself. And when you stand in the public's eye, people often wonder, what does the preacher say? What's the answer from the pulpit? And so I wanted to give you just some quick thoughts from something that happened yesterday, and hopefully that'll give you some things to think about. As I said earlier, um, I wish I'd have been thinking more clearly the other day. I think yesterday we should have had a a prayer service while the rally was going on. Uh, but we missed that. But God is gracious, isn't he? But we're here now, and so I want to call the deacons then and the elders, those who are here, brothers, if you'll come up here. I'm going to ask you to come one by one, and I want you to just spend some time in prayer. And as a church, we're going to pray along with them. If you'd like to get down on your knees, then get down on your knees. If you just need to stay seated where you are, then stay seated where you are. If you want to come up here to the altar, then come up here to the altar, and then we're going to conclude by having our wonderful communion with the Lord. Do you realize, beloved, that this act of communion is not just a historical marker, but we are entering into a very special and a very unique blessing of fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. As your heart was no doubt heavy yesterday, just let it rejoice right now knowing that Jesus is in full control of all things. Even what happened yesterday and even whatever may come in the days ahead, he is very well in control. And to that we, th we say thank you and we praise his name. Amen. All right. Brothers, Neil, you want to come on first? I don't know who's here with us. Um, Scott's coming. I think Jeff is out of the room right now. But um, I would just ask your indulgences as we uh, corporately go before the Lord as these men lead us in prayer. Others, go ahead. Just step up to the pulpit there.
Deus, eu vi o 